I now call uh, Parry Cockrell, Cockrell uh, who is our prospective parliamentary candidate for Cardiff Central. Ladies and gentlemen, the last time that fundamental changes to the British Constitution were made was over 300 years ago. In 1688, the year of the Glorious Revolution. Since then, of course, our Constitution has remained basically unchanged. However, it now appears that the government wished to alter fundamentally our Constitution without actually consulting the people. Now, the question I wish to put to you today is very simply this. If, for instance, in 1975, it was considered right that the British people could decide upon our membership of the European Economic Community, and if currently the Labour Party believes that it is right for the people of Scotland to be consulted about devolution, and if the Conservative Party agree that the people of Northern Ireland will be consulted regarding changes to their constitution, and if even the people of Duvaux in Wales who have recently held a referendum about Sunday drinking, can hold a referendum about an issue such as that, why can't the British people be consulted about our greatest constitutional change since 1688? <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, even though Parliament is going to be reduced to only a secondary legislative role within the European community, the government are totally unwilling to offer a full and fair referendum. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, the British people must have the ability to decide for themselves about this, our most important constitutional issue for 300 years. Now this, as we all know, can only be achieved by virtue of a full and fair referendum. Thank you very much. Now the next speaker is known to millions. He is one of his generation's most gifted, dignified and successful actors. After his national service, he entered the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts and after many long years of hard, practical work in theatres across the land, he achieved the success he deserved. He holds two BAFTA awards, a Broadcasting Press Guild Award, and many others far too numerous to mention. Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce to you Edward Fox. On September the 27th, 1974, Norman St. John Stevens, as he was then, on the Radio 4 program, Any Questions, said the referendum is, and I quote him, a nasty continental aberration. <laughs> Many leading politicians have made similar remarks all of them sharing the same belief that the referendum is not our way of doing things. On November the 19th, 1989, Mr. Michael Heseltine was quoted in The Guardian as saying that referendums were a form of government that was not attractive in Britain. Mr. Douglas Heard, on the 22nd of November 1991, again in The Guardian, was quoted as saying on the referendum, I do not think it is the right way to proceed in a parliamentary democracy. 
Lord Howe, on the 14th of July, 1993, told the House of Lords that the referendum, and I quote, is a formidable erosion of one aspect of parliamentary sovereignty. <laughs> On the same day as Lord Howe and in the same debate, Lord Jenkins said the referendum was, and again I'm quoting, a device which is fairly alien to our constitutional habits. These statements, though they ring with seemingly authoritative knowledge, are no more than superficial opinions bolstered by the well-dug-in effects of power. There have, in fact, been four referenda in this country in the last 20 years. The first was in 1973. This was the Northern Ireland border poll. The second was in 1975 on the Euro United Kingdom's continued membership of the European Community. So let it not be forgot that it was due to a referendum, no matter how flawed at the time, that we are part of the European Union today. The third was again in 1979, was rather in 1979, on devolution for Scotland. The fourth, again in 1979, on devolution for Wales. All these referenda have occurred on issues of fundamental constitutional importance. They have asked the people to decide issues of national importance that the politicians recognized they could not by themselves decide on their own. They needed the specific support of the nation as a whole. What is more, the politicians who allege that referenda are alien to the British way often emphasize their view by stating that referenda diminish parliamentary sovereignty. Mr. Douglas Hurd, in November 1991, said, in our parliamentary democracy, the line of democratic accountability runs from the government to the House, and from this House to those who send us there. John Patton, on July the 8th, 1991, stated, to transfer power directly to everyone through the medium of a referendum is to transfer power to too many. <laughs> Lord Wakeham, during the Lord's debate on a referendum in June of 1993, said that those who want a referendum, and I quote, inadvertently contribute to undermining the very system of parliamentary democracy which is their professed aim to protect. Lord Whitelaw told the House of Lords on July the 14th, 1993, and again I'm quoting, I strongly believe in our parliamentary procedure as the proper means of taking decisions. I am therefore strongly prejudiced against the use of referendums. The beliefs expressed by these politicians are, I suggest, hypocritical and full and full of deceit. <clears throat> For how may it be claimed that a referendum is unparliamentary because it diminishes the sovereignty of Parliament, whilst at the same time they propose surrendering to Brussels 
the very same parliamentary sovereignty they are claiming to protect. <laughs> the truth is that the referendum is entrenched in our history. Of the last 12 Conservative Prime Ministers, 10 have advocated or voted for a referendum in their lifetimes. They are Salisbury, Balfour, Bona Law, Baldwin, Churchill, Eden, Macmillan, Heath, Mrs. Thatcher, Mr. Major. When Britain decided to grant its colonies the right to independence, referenda were widely used to determine the wishes of the people. There have been seven altogether, from Jamaica in 1961 to Gibraltar in 1967. The last British colony to hold a referendum was Bermuda, just over a year ago. The foremost British constitutional writer, A.V. Dicey, was the first authoritative proponent of referenda in this country. In 1890, he wrote a paper entitled, Ought the Referendum to be Introduced into England? Dice's principle was that in a true democracy, the people empower the politicians and not the other way around. <laughs> In a false democracy, the politicians decide with which rights to empower the people. <laughs> Dicey wrote this, the main use of the referendum is to prevent the passing of any important act which does not command the sanction of the electors that it was the best, if not the only possible, check upon ill-considered alterations in the fundamental institutions of the country. His view was shared by the other great constitutionalist, W.E.H. Lecky who in his book, Democracy and Liberty, published in 1898, wrote, no serious thinker could fail to perceive the enormous danger of placing the essential elements of the Constitution at the mercy of a simple majority of a single parliament. <laughs> and now today, a century later, Every political party in Britain is in favor of referendums. The Labour Party have recently discussed as many as 13 referendums on a broad variety of issues from Scotland to a new voting system at Westminster. The Liberal Democrats have pledged a referendum on a single currency. Plaid Cymru propose a series of referendum options on Wales' relationship with the rest of the United Kingdom. The Scottish National Party propose a referendum on Scotland's independence. When the politicians find their arguments becoming more feeble, they turn to the fait accompli that Parliament has already ratified the Maastricht Treaty, that it is already there alongside the other treaties and cannot be now subjected to a referendum. But that again is no more than seemingly authoritative camouflage. The Treaty of Rome <laughs> The Treaty of Rome, which took us into Europe, was signed in 1973. 
But the referendum took place two years later, in 1975. Dr. Mawinney summed up this position in March of this year, when he told Parliament, it has been almost three years since Maastricht was ratified, after a full and intensive debate. And so, and so, and again I'm quoting him, there is no case for opening the debate. It is a settled matter. There will be no referendum on it. No doubt he too had forgotten the history of the 1975 referendum. As their arguments crumbled, the government has started to tinker with referenda. In the last 18 months, Mr. Major's government has offered two referendums, one on the results of the Northern Irish peace talks, the other on the single currency. Let us look at the facts. His pledge for a referendum on the single currency requires firstly that the Conservatives win the next general election. For the moment, that outcome is at best uncertain. <laughs> Secondly, that the Cabinet must collectively agree to join the single currency. And thirdly, that the decision to enter the single currency would need to be voted for by Parliament under a three-line party whip. In other words, the government would force every one of its members of Parliament to vote for a single currency in exactly the same way it did to force Maastricht through Parliament. <laughs> and only then would the people be asked to vote in a referendum. A referendum in which the massive propaganda power of government, with all its resources, would be committed to persuading the country to vote in one way only, that being in favor of joining the single currency. <laughs> unlike, unlike the government of Harold Wilson, Wilson in 1975, there would be no free vote Members of the cabinet or the backbenches would not be able to vote with their conscience, even on a matter of such fundamental national importance. Under Mr. Major, members of his government would have to publicly support entering a single currency or resign. So, Mr. Major's referendum pledge is a promise that satisfies his Chancellor, Mr. Kenneth Clark, and his deputy, Mr. Michael Heseltine, but it does not address the real issue, who governs Britain? <laughs> and far from being foreign to the traditions of our country, the referendum is an integral part of it. It has been either discussed or pursued or employed for over a century by at least 10 prime ministers. It is ingrained in the British way of doing things. It is the British way of doing things. In Britain's former colonies, it has been used seven times. In Britain itself, it has been used four times, and now all the political parties propose it innumerable times. But still, again and again, the government and the main political parties refuse to offer a referendum on this most fundamental issue of national importance, who governs Britain. And why? Because they fear the result. <laughs> Mr. 
What an indictment of our true democracy. The most important issue of the day, the future of this nation as a nation, is not to be submitted to the people because the politicians fear the free vote of free people.